Okay, so today uh, we continue our series uh, on prayer, the prayers of, of Jesus. Um, last week we had our sermon on the Lord's Prayer, but it was really like an introduction to prayer. Um, and so we talked about slowing down and creating space in our lives. And I really believe that that is the key to faithful prayer, is living an unhurried life. An unhurried life. And that is what Jesus modeled for us, is an unhurried life. And so um, I wanted to start the whole series with a call to stillness, a call to calmness. Psalm 4610 says, be still and know that I am God. So once we do that, then we are in a great place to fill our lives with prayer. You can't fill your lives with prayer until you take things out, right? You can't just keep adding stuff on your plate. You got to take stuff off so that there's room for the things in the plate. If you have a bottle of water and it's filled up to the top, you can't pour anything else into it unless you remove something, some of the liquid that's inside of it, right? So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about making space, making room, creating space in our lives for prayer. So if my temple is going to be a house of prayer, then I have to make room in this temple for prayer. So hopefully you all had a good week last week. Uh, you intentionally slowed down and you made time for prayer. Um, you lived at an unhurried pace. Um, I will, I will, uh, I'm thankful to say that I did better this week than I did the week before. So, and if not, then it's, it's a week by week thing. Try again this week. Live an unhurried life. And that really relates to the soul more than anything else. So first step, make space for God in your life. Second step, start praying. Start praying. That's what we're going to talk about today. So we're just going to get into praying. So why don't we start by standing up together? Um, I know that's intimidating because when I saw Eric ask you to turn to the east, I saw about 150 people that were like... Oh. It's like he asked you to clean your room. Oh. All right. But we're all standing. Thank you very much. All right. So um, let's, let's start off on the right foot here. So I, oh, I don't know if we have it here, but we can say it by memory if it's not there. So whose father? Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for what you're about to do. Um, Jesus, we thank you for this prayer that you gave us. And, uh, Lord, we, we want to enter into the depths of this prayer so that we can connect with you. Um, more intimately. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So I don't know if you guys remember this, uh, but uh, about a year ago, Pastor Tyler taught a lesson on the Lord's Prayer um, during our Tuesday, our Tuesday night Bible studies. And it was really good, so I asked him if I could uh, steal his message for this sermon. And he said no. But I took it anyway, and um, I didn't really care what he said. Which makes me feel bad, but I feel like I learned a big lesson out of that, which is, you know, if you're going to steal something, don't ask. That's just kind of a waste of time. So, but thank you, Tyler, wherever you are, for letting me steal your lesson. See, we're all about relationship here. You don't just steal. You got to think when you steal. So thank you for letting me steal. Okay. In the first century AD, we're getting started now. In the first century AD, every Jew knew how to pray. This was a hyper-religious group of people. So they all knew how to pray. They used um, scripture as a guide. They used liturgies as a guide. They, a lot of them, especially the Pharisees and the more religious sects, would pray uh, morning, noon, and night. So like this is a group that knows how to pray and that knows to pray, that, that they should be praying. The Jews were a praying people. But there was something about Jesus' life, because the disciples were watching Jesus all the time. Right? They were with him all the time. So they're watching his life and they're like, man, there's, there's something here about his life that is so profoundly different than the Pharisees and the other rabbis. And they noticed that it was prayer, I think. And so one day, uh, we talked about this last week, as Jesus was praying, his disciples came up to him and they were like, Lord, teach us, teach us to pray. Like, we want that. We want that. We want to know about that secret prayer life that you have, and we want that. 
So prayer was a huge part of Jesus' life, and they wanted it to be a huge part of their life too. Sometimes I think that if we could have seen how much Jesus prayed and how he labored in prayer, it would, it would change the way that we think about life. Not just the way that we live life, it would change the way that we think about life, period. Because if Jesus prayed as much as he prayed, if he was faithful in prayer, then we would realize that faithful prayer is an inescapable part of what it means to be human. Not just Christian, human. Prayer is for humanity. So that's why Jesus taught us to pray, because prayer is an essential part of being a human being. So we're going to take a look at the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to consider it as a prayer model, something to pray through. So in other words, the Lord's Prayer is made up of, of distinct elements, distinct categories that we can pray through in our, in our lives, in our own individual ways and, and contexts. Because you see, the Lord's Prayer is so much more than just a religious prayer to recite. It's a pattern. It's a key from Jesus Christ that enables us to have a successful prayer life. So each part of the Lord's Prayer is a vital part of having a healthy prayer life. I remember in my fourth year of college, I went to the gym like every day for quite a while. First time in my life, I started going to the gym every day. But I only did one exercise, I would do bicep curls. So I would large, I just wanted huge arms. So I largely prioritized my bicep curls. So by the end of that semester, uh, I had John Cena arms and a Richard Simmons body. It wasn't great. A lot of people didn't like it. And they told me. So I learned really quickly. But we all know that guy who goes to the gym and only works out like one part of their body, right? I just realized now I'm entirely Richard Simmons body. That's not good. Anyway, so we all know that guy that goes to the gym and, and they only, you know, work out one part of their body. Like they only do bench press or they only do arm curls or whatever it is. But if you're going to have an, a healthy exercise regimen, you have to work out all the main parts of your body, right? Every major part. You, got, you can't just work out your arms. You got to work out your chest and your back and your shoulders and your, your legs and whatever. So it's, that's what the Lord's Prayer is spiritually. It includes all the vital parts of your spiritual life, starting with our Father in heaven. So Jesus could have chosen a ton of terms for God. Think about all the names that there, that there are for God. He could have chosen the word creator or great one or God, but instead he chose a term that, is, that was highly irregular, for Jews at that time, and this term was only used to describe God a few times in Scripture, the word Father. There's only a few verses in the Old Testament where God is described as Father. One of those passages is Isaiah 64, verse 8. Yet, Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We all are the work of your hands. So, like, even there, Jesus could have chosen the word potter. Like our potter who art in heaven, hallowed be thy pottery hands. But he didn't say that. He said our father. It's a relational term. It's a family term. Jesus tells us to start off with who we are and who he is. We start out with identity and relationship. And it doesn't matter um, whether or not you're going to go choose to pray through the Lord's prayer as a prayer model. You should always start with identity. You should always start praying as his son or as his daughter. Always start with relationship. Always. So that's exactly what we need to do. At the beginning of all of our prayers, acknowledge who, we is, who he is to us and who we are to him. Amen? Because that changes everything. Prayer must always begin with relationship. If you don't begin with relationship, it's performance. It immediately becomes performance if you don't start with relationship. So if you recite the Lord's Prayer without acknowledging God as Father, and you as son or daughter, then the whole thing falls apart. Effective prayer begins by recognizing your identity in Christ. You are a beloved child of God. J.I. Packer said, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. So always start off 
by praying or by remembering who you're praying to. God is your father who is great and he's glorious, the creator of all things. He can't be contained by heaven and earth. And you are his child. You aren't some far off acquaintance. You are his highly loved child who has full access to him through the blood of Jesus Christ who saved you, healed you, set you free and adopted you into his family. Amen? Amen. So God is first and foremost our father. Thank you, Jesus. Number two, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. We don't use the word hallowed very often anymore. The CSB version translates this part as your name be honored as holy. So this is what we would call worship. We acknowledge our identity as sons and daughters of a heavenly father, and then we begin to worship. We take time to be in awe of him, to consider who he is and what he has done, and then to tell him all those thoughts. We worship him because he is good. We worship him because he's holy. We worship him because he is a God of patience and joy. We worship him because he is a God who is eternal. He's never ending. He is uncaused. He's a God of victory. He's a man of war. He's undefeated in battle. He's so many things. If you really think about all the things that God is and find reasons to praise him, you will begin to pour out an ocean of praise. He is both father and he is son. He's the good shepherd and he's the lamb of God. He is all powerful and he is all humble. Amen? Can we just praise him this morning? He is so many wonderful things. We can praise him at all times because he's so worthy of so much praise. That's why King David said in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. He is always worthy of worship, honor, and praise. The next line of the Lord's prayer is this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, so when a king rules, when a king rules, his kingdom is, his kingdom extends as far as his authority extends, right? So God establishes his kingdom on the earth as he advances his authority. But his authority isn't resisted by birds or planes or weeds or buildings or organizations or trees or land. His authority is resisted by human hearts. That's where the resistance comes into play. So if we're going to pray and ask God to establish his kingdom on the earth, then it must be established through hearts. Does that make sense? And the first heart that must be dealt with is my own. So what does it look like for God to have more dominion in my life, in this area of my life, or that area of my life? How do I take steps toward Christ, steps of surrender to his kingship today? Because that will advance the kingdom of God. And that's something something that I can actually control, is my own relationship with my Father. And then the other aspect is this, is that we pray for the surrender of other hearts as well. So God is a strategic king. He has strategies in place to reach the broken and the hurting and to bring them into his kingdom. So we align ourselves with his desire and his plan whenever we intercede for others to be surrendered to the kingship of Jesus Christ. Um, and at this point, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on to the next part of the prayer, but I just, I just wanna encourage you. When you're going through the Lord's Prayer and you're praying, spend some time on this part. Spend a good amount of time on this part. I don't, I don't have time to unpack how significant it is to pray that God's kingdom would come and that his will would be done. It's extremely significant. Number four, give us this day our daily bread. So now is the time to ask for your needs. Now is the part of the prayer to ask for your needs. You may have noticed that the Lord's Prayer is divided up into two parts. There's two sets of petitions. The first set of petitions is all about the Lord. It's all centered around God getting what he wants. Your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And then there's a second set of petitions about us getting what we want. It's our bread and our forgiveness and our temptation. Do you see what Jesus is doing? Jesus is prioritizing God above you, which is so appropriate, (laughs) right? So profound that he does that because he is God. Everyone on earth has a destiny. Every person in this room 
has a destiny. Each one of you that I look at, you have a destiny that God holds in his hand. He's got a plan for you. He's got good things for you. He has a destiny for your life. But I have heard people talk about their destiny all day long and obsess about their destiny all day long and talk about God's destiny for their life and on and on and on they go and they forget about God's destiny. Because you see, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth and he was crucified, he was dead, he was buried, he rose again from the dead and then he ascended into heaven. And then his father promised him a pure and spotless bride that he is destined to receive when he returns to the earth a second time. And Jesus Christ has a destiny to return to this earth and to receive an inheritance that he paid a high, heavy cost for, and it is the sanctified body of Christ, a holy and godly church. What am I doing about that destiny? What am I doing to help him fulfill his destiny above my own? You see the difference? That's what Jesus is establishing. So the Lord's prayer teaches me that above anything I want, I pray for what God wants first, and then I seek what I want. And then I seek what I need. That's the appropriate order, amen? So Lord, give me my daily bread. Here's what I need. I receive my needs in the name of Jesus. Talk to him about what you need. Tell him what you're worried about. And ask and expect him to generously provide for you, and he will. Notice that it says today. In other words, trust him to give you what you need for today. You can come back to him tomorrow for the stuff you need tomorrow. Nothing is too small. Nothing is too unimportant for God to care about. Nothing is too unimportant to ask him about. He cares about everything that you desire. He created your heart and he knows your desires and he loves to provide for you and to bless you. I love this story and I've told it a few times, I think, maybe, but I had an English teacher in college, in my first year of college, 2002, and she was from India. And before she was a professor at that college, she was a professor at a university in India. And she told our class this story one time about prayer. She said, when I was a professor in India, I would every morning wake up and I would go downstairs and I would call a cab and that cab would take me to the university. And every single morning, as soon as I got into that cab, I would silently pray for that cab driver. And I would ask the Lord to bless that cab driver. And I didn't think anything about it. I just kind of prayed it and then went on with my life. And months later, I noticed that every single time I would go downstairs, that the cab drivers would fight over me. They would fight over me to take to take, them to, to, to take me to the university. And so one day I asked the cab driver, I said, why, are you, why do you guys do this? Like, why are you trying to fight to get me to take me to the university? And he said, well, because every, what, whoever gets you as a customer has the craziest, most successful day. We don't know why, that's just what happens. Amen, give the Lord praise. There's nothing too small. He hears all of those things. I don't even think she cared about it as much as he cared about it, as much as God cared about it. So she's throwing out this prayer, not realizing that God is listening and he's answering. There's nothing too small. He hears everything. He sees everything. He knows everything. He cares about all of it. So we don't come to him like he's a vending machine. He's not a machine. And this isn't a mechanical process. It's not a procedure we come to him in relationship, and when we do that, we operate in relationship. Children ask their fathers for all kinds of things, and a good father is delighted to give good things to his children, amen? Next thing, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Other translations say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. You know what this tells me? It tells me that prayer is for sinners. Prayers for sinners. That means that it's for you and it's for me. It's for everyone. There's no one on earth who this prayer isn't for. 
I'm so glad that prayer is for sinners. It changes everything. I'm so glad that Jesus included this portion in the prayer. He knew that we needed it, and he knows that our Father wants to forgive us. Our Father loves to forgive us. He is never reluctant to forgive. So if you need forgiveness in your life for something that you've done, then take it. It's yours. God is holding his hand out to you and he is offering his love, his grace, his mercy, his restoration, and his forgiveness beyond measure. Receive it in the name of Jesus Christ. And then once your heart is, is filled with the love and forgiveness of God, once you're set free from the influence and power of sin, then you will be in a place to consider the people that you need to forgive. Is there someone you need to forgive? Work out those heart issues with your father. See, this is why the Lord's Prayer isn't a prayer to recite. It's not a prayer of recitation. It's an invitation. It's not recitation. It's conversation. This is a moment to talk to God about it. Have a real conversation with him about it. God, that person hurt me. I'm struggling with this. Be real. And then move forward in faith and forgive. If someone hurt you, then... Your forgiveness means that you choose to transfer the debt that they owe you to God. Let him be the one that takes care of it. So let the sin against you be a sin against God because that's actually what it is, right? Anytime someone sins against you, it's important to recognize that the biggest issue isn't that they sinned against you and we think that it is because we like to be the center of the universe. The bigger issue is that they sinned against God. So transfer it to God and let God take care of it. Sin and unforgiveness binds us and we need the Lord to set us free. This is the pattern for doing that. Notice how everything is ordered. Everything in the proper order. Everything in its proper place. We seek what God wants first, then we seek what we want. We ask God for forgiveness for our sins, then we can offer forgiveness to others. Six, do not lead us into temptation. So why do we need to ask God to not lead us into temptation? Because God directs our steps. And he knows when we're going to be tempted. And in those moments of temptation, we are asking for his help. We know that God never tempts us. It is sinful desires that do. First Peter 2.11, dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against your soul. <laughs> there, are sin there is something outside of us in the world called sin that wages war against us. So in this part of the prayer, we're, we're asking God for help in avoiding sin, for strength to choose the way out that he provides. This section reminds us to be holy. It holds up our sin to us, reminding us of how much God hates sin, how serious he is about it, and how much we need his help to avoid it. Number seven, but deliver us from the evil one. So this is about asking for protection from the enemy. This one and the last one go hand in hand with one focused on protection from the flesh and this one protection from the enemy. So the enemy can also bring affliction rather than temptation and this part is asking for deliverance from that as well. This part is about spiritual warfare. Every believer has been given the authority of Jesus Christ to resist the devil. But that, that authority is contingent on something. That authority is only given to those who will live their lives in obedience to Christ. That authority is only given to those who will live their lives in submission to God. So that's why James 4, 7 says, therefore, submit to God. Notice that that's first. Again, everything's ordered. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. First, we submit. Second, we resist. You cannot do it the other way around. You cannot resist in order to submit. First, submit. Second, resist. You can't resist if you don't submit. It's just how it works. So you probably shouldn't expect God to deliver you from the evil one if you're not willing to submit to Christ. So in other words, if you're asking God to deliver you from Satan, all while giving in to your fleshly desires, then you're doing two contradictory things at the same time. So it's, it's like this. See, because there's a difference between being tempted and you seeking out sin. Woo! He's preaching now. There's a difference between you being tempted, me being tempted, and me seeking out my sin. There's such a difference. So what can end up happening is that if you're seeking out sinful things and you aren't in temptation, you're, rebe you're in rebellion. 
If I'm praying to be delivered from Satan's authority, but I'm also trying to be delivered from God's authority, how is that going to work in my life? It doesn't work. Submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee, and God will deliver you from the evil one. Amen? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This one's really simple. I'm not going to talk a lot about this. We wrap it up with worship. Starts with worship, ends with worship. I love, I love how the Lord Jesus did that. And that's it. That's what the Lord's prayer, isn't that profound? That's what the Lord's prayer, that's just a, a very quick overview of the Lord's prayer. Piece by piece by piece. It's pretty simple, but it keeps our hearts right as we approach the Lord and as we approach others. It keeps our hearts balanced spiritually. So remember that this is a memory tool that, that Jesus was giving us. It's not about legalism. This isn't meant to be rigidly applied with no exceptions. It's meant to be done in relationship, even a, a partnership. So praying is a, is a, it's a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. We usually say that prayer is all about talking to God. I've actually said that a lot. But the more that I think about it and the more that I learn how to pray, the more I realize that prayer is not talking to God. Prayer is talking with God. It's talking with God to the point to where sometimes when I pray, I ask God to tell me how to pray. I ask him, what do you want me to pray for? What is it that I need to pray for? The point of prayer is to align my heart with God so much so that it changes me. I heard Greg Laurie say earlier this week that he thinks that prayer changes us more than our circumstance. Totally agree with that changes us more than our circumstance. That's the whole point of prayer, is to connect us to God and to make us like him. So it's not meant to be this rigid thing. It's a beautiful model. And I would highly recommend that you begin to pray through the Lord's Prayer every single day. And you can add other things to your prayer regimen. That's all well and good. So like I add one very simple thing that has been so helpful to me in my prayer life. When I started doing this, it, it changed the way that I pray and it turned it from performance to relationship. And it comes from Genesis chapter three, verse eight through nine. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And so the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? Where are you? I learned, this from, I learned this from a pastor named Alan Croft. Before he prays, he lets the Lord ask him that question. So before I pray now, I always just kind of stop and I become still and I hear the voice of the Lord saying to me, John, where are you? And I'll begin to acknowledge where I am. My thoughts, my feelings, my fears, my doubts, my struggles, my hurts, my pain. And I will just come before the Lord and say, this is where I am. This is how I am. And then after doing that, after acknowledging how I really am doing, where I am before the Lord, then I can move forward into praying in relationship. If I don't do that, it's like it all just becomes performance, like really quickly. I'm not acknowledging where I am. I'm not bringing God into my life in a real vulnerable and honest way. So I always start with letting the Lord ask me, where are you, son, daughter? Where are you? The more that I do that, the more that I'm empowered to pray, like really pray. It has freed me up in my prayer life. The more that I pray, the more I get closer to God and see victories in my life and victories in other people's lives. The more I see him moving, the more I know him. So to this point, and I just, I just want to take a moment to encourage you guys as we wrap up this morning. There is a huge cost to prayerlessness. Just a huge cost in your life. When you refuse to pray, you have no strength in your life. There's no power in your life. There's no, there's no, like you're not going to receive your needs from him. 
You don't go closer to him. You don't discover his will. You don't become like him. I find that, that those Christians who, who don't pray and don't read their Bible and don't worship and don't spend time with God and have their devotional time with God and don't seek God and expect to become like him are like people who want to go to the, who want to lose 300 pounds but they don't want to stop eating and they don't want to go to the gym and exercise and do everything that their, their doctor is telling them to do so that they can live. They go to the doctor and the doctor's like, oh, you have diabetes, you have really high blood pressure, you have this issue, you need to do this. And they're like, well, okay. And then they don't do it. They're not intentional about it. So you shouldn't expect it if you're not going to do the things. There is a life that you can have as a Christian where you actually become like Christ. But it takes intentionality. You actually have to go to the gym and watch what you eat and you have to change your lifestyle and you have to put in the hard work to become like Christ, but it actually happens. That is a wonderful thing. That's your destiny. Your destiny is to become like Christ. So the other side of this coin is that prayer has a huge payoff this humongous payoff where you do discover his will. You do become like him and you do receive power and strength and purpose for your life and you experience beauty and joy and the love of God. There's an incredible payoff to spending time in prayer with God. And I love that this is a together thing. We get to do this together. So profound that Jesus did not say my father. He said our father. Our father. He said our daily bread. He said our sins. He did that very specifically. If you want power and purpose in your life, then pray to your father. But if we want power and purpose over Christ Community Church, then we need to pray to our father together. Amen? So let's pray together. Pray when you get together. Pray in your groups. Pray in your community groups. Pray with your friends here. If you want power and purpose and victory here, then let's do that. Pray for your pastors. Pray for shameless plug. Pray for people to be saved and healed and set free. Come to the sanctuary and pray with us. We pray 7.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. We pray 8 a.m. on Tuesday mornings. We open up the sanctuary for corporate prayer at those times. And we're going to make sure to remind you on, on social media or, throughout a tech, or through a text message um, if we have your number. So we're committed to sending you a prayer prompt, a prayer prompt every day this upcoming week. So check out our Facebook page for that. Uh, make sure that we have your phone number. If you want to receive those text messages, you can do that by scanning the QR code in the seat back in front of you. It'll take you to a digital connection card. We want to be a people who pray. We want for Jesus to say, yes, this is a house of prayer. We want Jesus to say that about this house, right? So let's commit to this. Let's make space in our lives as we talked about. And let's start praying together. Let's pray through the Lord's prayer in our own time, in our secret place. Let's pray together. Let's come together and have times of corporate worship and pray faithfully and see what God will do. I can already guarantee you that if we would pray together, if this church became more and more and more a praying church as Jesus wants it to be, the, the things that God would do here would blow our minds. It would not look the same. I love what God is doing here, and I want God to continue to do more things, but the things that we want to see are not accessible without praying together. They're just not. If you want to see God do great things in this community, then you, we have to start praying together. If we want to see Alamogordo fall in love by the power, with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, then we have to start praying together. That's where the power is. That's where the power is. That's where the victory is. It's all accessible through prayer. Let's stand together. Would you stand with me? Why don't we say the Lord's Prayer together one last time as we close? <clears throat> all right. Who's Father? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise this morning? Thanks again for joining us today. If you're in the Alamogordo area, we would love for you to join us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11. Visit us at ChristCommunityAlamo.org or download our app from the App Store where you can find more information about Christ Community, share a prayer need, or even give to this ministry. God bless you and thank you for being a part of Christ Community Church where it's about relationship and not religion.